All right, everybody, my name is Nicole Rasmussen. I am the area agronomist with DuPont Pioneer here in Southern Alberta. My territory goes from the US border to about Red Deer. I also cover BC. So I get to see corn grown in some pretty uh, interesting areas, but do probably spend most of my time, you know, south of Calgary. Um, today we're gonna talk about, you know, considerations for growing corn. Uh, anybody here grow corn? Want to? Yeah, grow some. I know Corny's here, so I gotta make sure I don't make any mistakes. Anybody else? No? How many of you are like industry people? Okay, good deal. So um, when we met to talk about putting this together, uh, Jamie and Ken and Adrian and I, we kind of based it around a guy who's thinking of growing corn for the first time and what are the things he needs to think of and be aware of. It's not uh, max production, it's kind of just base decision-making stuff here. So. Um, we're gonna go through kind of stuff from deciding what we're gonna do with our corn to at this station up until, you know, the corn's out of the ground a little bit here. So um, can anybody describe what, uh, how to decide their maturity they need to pick for their corn crop? It's, no? Heat units? What's the problem with just heat units in general and selecting corn hybrid? There's like absolutely no industry standard for maturity ratings in corn. So the corn I sell has a heat unit rating, but it might be totally different in some ways than what corny sells, right? There's no standard and how each company goes about their measurement is different. So it can be really confusing. Um, we also talk uh, relative maturity, you know, uh, we might hear someone say 80 day corn, 100 day corn. And that's another way to look at uh, the differences in maturity between hybrids but there still is no standardization there necessarily. So it can be confusing and there's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. It's just about understanding what it is you have. So we rate our corn maturities to about 24 to 26% grain moisture. Some competitors do silage, you know, a, a maturity to silage, 50% milk line, you know, right in that silage zone. Some take it from when the seed goes in the ground to harvest moisture, some take it from when the seeds emerge to harvest moisture. And within those variances can be pretty big differences. So just be sure when you're talking with whomever you buy your seed from that you understand what their base is so you can understand how that fits at your farm. And if you're going to compare everybody else together that, you know, if you grew something that was 2200 somewhere else, how does that compare to a different company's 2200? They can be pretty, pretty big swings there. So just be really aware of that. You know, the next most important thing is gonna be what are you gonna do with that crop, right? You know what the heat units are for your zone, but what are you gonna grow? Are you gonna grow grain, silage, grazing corn? That needs to be really clearly defined so your salesperson can help narrow down the right maturity for you as well. Because if you live in a 2200 heat unit corn zone, you know, what you need for silage is later, what you need for grains a little earlier. So we need to be sure we're communicating that and understanding those purposes so we can really match you up with the right corn hybrid. Um, it happens every year that uh, the guy says, well, I, I bought this heat unit before from the other guy, you know, yours is way earlier or way later. And that's true. And so we just need to make sure that we're all comparing apples to apples. You know, we understand that. It, it can cause a lot of headaches for experienced corn people to understand. You know, it's up to us to make sure we understand where our competitors' stuff kind of lies, so we understand it all together as an industry a little bit better, but it's kind of not a very simple, simple system to understand. And uh, my, how I did it when I started at Pioneer, I took one hybrid and I knew we had a lot of it, and I kind of compared how everything else went to that, and it kind of gave me my baseline. So if you've got a neighbor, maybe you've seen growing corn, ask them what it is, and if it's always finished at a good date for you, you know, maybe pick that for your number. You know, whomever's selling your seed hopefully has a good idea of your area and they can kind of give you something on a baseline and then you work, you know, above or below that. So be sure you understand, you know, when you're comparing and you're clearly sharing with whomever you're buying that seed from what it is you want to do with it. Because if you wanted to plant one field and take it for grain and take it for silage, you're leaving yield on the table for one or the other. You know, you're not able to to maximize it because with corn the longer the season is generally the the better the yield potential so if you know you're going for silage you're going to be going for something a little more heat units and grain but if you plant a hybrid that finishes for grain you're not going to get the yield out of it you should so you know make sure everybody's on the same boat and no one hybrid is going to do all major purposes on your same farm the question is heat unit 
measurement is standard across Canada and the U.S.? Well, there's different types of heat unit measurements. You know, you look at a, there's a CHU, there's a GDU. You know, the, the formula is the same. You just have to make sure you're looking at the right, the same one on everybody's, right? If someone's using a growing degree unit and you're looking at a CHU unit, that formula is different. There'll be some variances. There's a conversion rate of, to put them, you know, together, but everybody does use a little bit different. Some people, you know, and it depends on what you're looking at, their start date and their end dates can be different and but uh, you know Environment Canada you can pull some of that data some different other environment or weather websites have uh, CHUs or GDUs that some you can select which one you want or they list them all but there is uh, that is the kind of the next confusion point. There's different sets for one starts at five one starts at ten. Yeah and then their highs and their yeah their lows and yeah they do it's a different calculation but their their goal is you know the same purpose. You know, and some guys might have a GDU rating on their catalog versus a CHU rating. So like I said, it's important to make sure everybody understands what is being measured there. And like I said, there's no right or wrong, just be clear to make sure we know what's going on. Any questions there? No? So the next fun question I've had asking everybody is we're moving into fertility. Something near and dear to my heart. I sold fertilizer for a long time. And uh, Courtney will ask if you don't answer this one but uh who can tell me how much nitrogen it takes to grow a bushel of corn one one anybody else the last guy said 13. i said well i wish i would have sold him some fertilizer and made a lot of money. <laughs> but it is one you know corn's a very efficient user of fertilizer and i think a lot of the misconception comes as we read these articles about these big yield corn growers in the u.s growing you know three four hundred bushels and they're putting on you know 400 plus pounds of nitrogen you know, it's a very efficient crop. Um, the big number comes from just the bushels and the tonnage we're growing, right? Our, if you're growing 150 bushels of grain corn, you need 150 pounds in. You know, that's in relation not a lot to what you might need for a 50 bushel canola crop, right? So keep it in perspective. You don't have to be scared to grow corn just because of the fertilizer requirements. It's all relative to the bushels you're getting, right? I don't think you can disagree. It's an efficient user of fertilizer for what you get out of it. You know, better than a lot of the other crops are growing for how many pounds of N per bushel it requires. Well, like no, three times that. Yeah, exactly, right? So when you look at it in relations, you know, the, the yield isn't as high and you're putting on maybe the same amount of fertilizer, right? So, so it is pretty efficient. And same with water. Corn can use, uh, it can use moisture from really deep. It's got really good strong roots. And it has a lot of uh, built-in abilities to withstand drought as well. And uh, we've got dry land corn by Brooks, and it's doing really well, you know, and that's a pretty dry part of the world without irrigation. So I think, uh, you know, people realize too how efficient of a, a water user it is, they'd be surprised. You know, when it gets really hot out, it curls those leaves up and it closes the stomatas and it, you know, it's keeping as much of that moisture inside of it as it can. So it's a, you know, a pretty resilient plant through drought stress as well. So any other questions before we dig a plant up? Okay, well, come on closer. We're going to stage a corn plant. Did Gordon talk to you? Did you guys come from Gordon? Did he talk to you about staging corn? Okay, come in tighter here. Okay. So now, like with any crop, it's important to know how to properly stage it for herbicide timing. Um, the blue book here in Alberta gives us many different uh, descriptors on how to stage a corn plant. And it can be a pretty confusing process. It's something we all get a lot of questions about every year, is, is how big is my corn and can I still spray this chemical on it? So I'm going to show you the V method. That's what we use most of all. So the very first leaf here is our V1 leaf, and it's the corn's thumb leaf, first leaf to emerge shorter and it has a somewhat rounded tip okay I'll pass this around after you guys can all look at it so what we count in the V system is collars so the thumb leaf is V1 V2 V3 and V4 so we see a fully fully developed leaf collar there okay that's how we you know internally we talk about leaf staging and it's you know probably the most standard in the industry is the V stages okay so if someone says that they have a, a four leaf corn 
I'm going to be able to count four of these collars on there, including the thumb leaf. What happens sometimes, though, is, is we get frost, or we get wind, and we lose a thumb leaf. Maybe we get frost, we lose a couple leaves. We still got to count them, right? Because if a frost takes these, you know, that's not a one leaf corn plant, right? It's, it's where it was before it lost those. So, you know, if you're not seeing that thumb leaf, you know, check when you're out there. If it's not there, you still have to count it. There's ways if you cut it open and you can count nodes, but it's a little hard to see that out here in the field on the corn that's still this little. But uh, count the collars. And each leaf collar is a, is a one leaf stage. What happens is, is uh, I, certain chemicals in the blue book, they'll say, you know, spray till the longest leaf extended is 15 centimeters high. Or some will do the droopy leaf method and it'll be to count a leaf once the leaf droops over. But the problem with that is now certain hybrids, their leaves don't droop equally as much as others, you know, and it's just not as easy to define. And you got to be careful with that. And same with the, the, the height. Uh, we grow corn in a greenhouse and a two leaf corn plant will be taller than this four leaf corn plant. So the height staging is a really uh, difficult and scary method to use too. You know, don't tell your guy, yeah, my corn, go in and say, I need to spray my corn, it's uh, six inches tall. You know, he count the collars and say, you know, I've, I've got three collars, I'm at V3 corn. And then you can work to make sure that you're as close to being where you actually need to be. And it just leaves less room for errors in the staging. So look for that thumb leaf, that nice little round one, and go up from there. That's your first true leaf. So when we move over here, what we see here is uh, some funny looking corn. So this is our frost simulation. And what Jamie's team did is they came out here in that V2, so two full collars, and they clipped the corn right to the ground to kind of simulate a frost where that a frost would have burned that corn plant right off to the ground. So you can see here it came back and it looks like it's hurting a little and, and it is suffering, but it's definitely growing back. It's had a lot of stress. Yes. <laughs> so it's, it's stressed, but it's coming back. And we see a lot of frost, you know, especially to the north. And the corn recovers like guys are shocked every year. A growing point and the corn is below the ground so it can withstand the stress. It comes above the ground at about the V5, V6 stage. You know, so as you're getting closer to there, it's closer to the surface, it can withstand a little less frost. And that's maybe what we're seeing in this one here. You did this last Friday, Jamie, you know, just after a whole bunch of rain and it was really, really stressed. And I don't know if the other crew threw my plants back down here. Oh, no, they didn't. So what you can do though to, to assess for, for um, frost damage in your corn is just like any crop, wait a few days after and then come out. And let me find one here. You're gonna cut it open to see what that growing point looks like. You know, if you're seeing new growth, that's obviously a good sign and you're gonna be fine. But if you haven't seen it, maybe it's still a little cold, you can cut them open and check out that growing point and see if it survived. So you split the corn carefully and safely right through to the bottom and you split it open and the growing points right down here. Come in close. We'll pass it around. And now I'm waving my knife around. <laughs> right. So our growing points down here, you know, and it's looking pretty brown and nasty, right? Do you see that down here at the bottom? Yeah, it's, it's suffering, right? And this stuff was under some stress and then it got clipped to the ground. So it was maybe just a little more than it could handle. But this plant that was, you know, simulated earlier, obviously has some new growth, but we'll look at the growing point in this one. Oh, I picked a bad one. This guy's dying too. Yeah, so you know the soil level was to about here, right? So we're going to split this one open. Yeah. And you can see it's a nice healthy whitey color. You can see that nice new yellow green growth coming in the bottom there. And this corn had experienced, you know, that simulated frost at a pretty early age. So, you know, check for that. You know, and corn's interesting at that growing point there. I heard Corny mentioning it. If you had a really good microscope too, you could see it the tassels in there already, the, the ear shoots are in there already, and all the leaves are there, 
right? So if you, you know, had the ability to really zoom in, the bigger the corn, the easier it is to see, but it's all in there. You know, if, so if that gets damaged, you're done. But it can get chewed off to the ground. It can get frosted off to the ground, and it'll take a lot of stress at that point. Yeah. Does the, uh, does the frost affect the root system at all? Well, I mean, if the frost goes down that hard, it's going to, if it affects the roots, it's going to kill the corn. Generally. Yeah, so if the corn leaf isn't there, well, then the root system isn't going to really produce. Well, it, you know, you'll be surprised. It'll still pick up energy in the growing point if that little triangle's still safe. Mm -hmm. It'll pop out another little leaf and you'll just see it coming out. But remember, count those leaves, right? This has been frosted. It's missing a bunch of leaves. But it was planted the same time as that, and it's that stage in this corn plant's mind. So, you know, just be really aware of that. It might be a leaf behind because it's stressed, right? But, you know, it, it definitely thinks it's older than it really is. Now, if it's got compounded stress, like a whole bunch of rain, then it gets clipped off to the ground. It's no different than any crop taking multiple stresses, a hail and sclerotinia on canola or whatever. It's just, you know, the com combination of the two is really going to knock them down. So you're looking at the purple leaves. So that's a good one. Some guys catch this, some guys don't. Any idea of what can cause this? The purpling? The purpling or the rep? The purpling. Nitrogen. Any other ideas? Cold weather. Cold weather, exactly. So purpling is a sign of a lot of that. Um, stress will turn a lot of corn plants purple. It's a, it's a natural part of the corn plant and it gets cold and stressed or even if like a really warm days and it drops down to a cooler temperature at night, it'll trap some of them sugars in the, in the leaves and they'll turn purple. Or you'll see it really early when the soil's cold and it isn't grabbing enough phosphate. You plant it on some canola stubble, you know, we all know that's not a great thing to place to plant corn crops. And you'll see some of that early too. But if it's just from a, a temperature stress or stuff, don't worry about it. Drive away, come back, it'll be fine. They haven't ever been able to attribute it to, to significant yield reductions as long as it can recover from better heat at some point. The worst problem it causes is it means it's probably not been growing very hard because it's been cold. So we've seen, I've seen a field by Medicine Hat a couple years ago and it was like totally purple. I stopped, I got out and it was like totally purple. And I called the guy and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, this field looks really bad. And I went to my parents in Saskatchewan and I came back on the Monday and it was already starting to bump out of it. So it, uh, it's pretty resilient for that, but it'll, it'll shock you sometimes. You'll see that and it'll be scary. And some hybrids just have that you know, in their background, a little bit of that purpling will show up, especially lower here on the stem. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's deficient or stressed at all. Just some corn plants, that hybrid has some of that in it. So, you know, if you're seeing it, especially down here on these lower leaves, don't stress out too much. It's, uh, you know, most likely down here, just a hybrid characteristic. Just to give you an idea of how the corn plant is resilient, if you look at the uh, bale tables for corn, they don't start until seven full leaves. Yeah. Okay, and 100% defoliation at seven leaf stage is going to result in 9% decrease in your yield. 100% defoliation at seven leaf. So it's tough. It's really tough. So are these ones that are uh, just cut off? I think some of these are probably not going to make it just because I think of the amplified stress from all the rain. But there's a few of them, like there was one at the last group I found that was actually starting to have some new growth in it already. And I cut it open and they must have blown away in the wind here or something. I was going to save it for you guys, but some of them might still. But I think the combination of the two probably stung it up a little bad. We had a whole field turned black. Two big two leaf, almost three leaf from frost. We were crying and it all came back and you couldn't. Yeah. And fall was pretty big size. You know, it, it's been stressed in some of, you know, because, you know, at this stage right now, the corn's determining how many rows around it's going to be, you know, right now. As it gets closer to tasseling, it's how many, how many kernels long it's going to be, right? So stress at this stage can impact your yield, but it's not, you know, like you said, you lo lose that whole plant and it comes back and it's a very acceptable crop, right? It might be later, you know, it might be hurt, but we can still, you know, make something of it. What you got there, Corny? We found the cob on this plant. So We've got bigger eyes than me. So if it's cold, then it starts growing really hard. That corn might get a little floppy just because it's just leaves growing really fast and the wind might push it over and it'll come back a little bit. You know, it, uh, it's, we're going to get there, you betcha. So before we move to the next session, any more questions here about the frost?
Good. We're good on staging. Good. So this is the uh, the one I love the picture of the what the crew did here. This is our uh, our cold chill plot. So corn at that stage can obviously take a pretty good amount of frost and cold. But what it doesn't like is cold moisture when it gets first put in the ground. So the most critical time period is the first 72 hours. The seed is in the ground. It needs to not absorb freezing cold water, like water close to zero degrees Celsius. You know, so if you plant your corn and there's a heavy, heavy wet snow coming, that's just about the worst thing that we can have happen at that point, right? We want to make sure it's been in the ground a few days to acclimatize, soak in some moisture that isn't super cold. A uh, number of different years we've called farmers to maybe say stop planting, you know, don't rush to get finished into that snowstorm because that can cause a lot of problems. So Jamie and her crew dump bags of ice. They plant and they dump bags of ice down the top and then they poured some water over and we were trying to simulate some of that cold chill. And um, what you'll see on the really severe ones, you'll dig up, you know, you'll see a gap and you'll dig it up and there'll be a corn that's really corkscrewed. So, and then sometimes they turn around, sometimes they put out leaves. But they're just all scattered up inside because they got that first water was really cold. So cold chill happens a lot to us almost every year in the north. You know, uh, my colleagues and customers up by Red Deer and that Rimby country, they see a lot of that. They get those late, heavy, wet snows. And it can cause a lot of damage to your crop. That cold also causes an uneven, unevenness in emergence. You know, you came from the last one. We talked about how important that even emergence is for corn. You drive by a lot of fields this year and you're going to see a lot of the corns at different stages, right? Some of that has to do with just cold soils, cold temperatures. Some of it has to do with some compaction, surface compaction this year. Soil. Yeah, exactly, right? You'll, you'll see that little corn plant and he's all like bundled up underneath there just kind of waiting to pop up. When the rain comes, he bursts through. So we've seen a lot of that this year. So, you know, if you're going to plant corn and the snow is coming, you know, it's probably best to wait if you can. Right? If you've got really warm soils and maybe you're hoping that snow won't amount to much, the weather guy's wrong again. You know, it's, it's a risky proposition, but it's, it's damaged a lot of corn crops pretty severely, especially in areas farther north. And, uh, you know, it's just something to be really, really aware of that stress on that seed. You know, you see it can take the frost when it's out of the ground, but it doesn't like it, you know, just as a seedling that hasn't started to germinate yet. So just be really aware of that. Um, that even unevenness and germination alone is going to leave a lot of your yield on the table. So, you know, we like to say corn should be planted into at least 10 degrees Celsius soil. You know, optimum's 20. So 10 degrees is just like good enough, right? It, it does its best at 20. So anything cooler than 10 is obviously going to put some extra stress on that corn plant, maybe slow its emergence and leave it susceptible for pests like a wireworm. You know, wireworm is a real growing problem with corn. It's not going away. We see more of it every year. Um, it's treated for wireworms, but like any crop, it only lasts on the seed treatment so long, the efficacy. So if you plant into cold soil and it's not emerging for a week and a half and then it's real slow to get going, you know, that seed treatment's slowly wearing off and those wireworms are still feeding and they'll just go down the row. And uh, we've had lots of customers have to plow cornfields down because of wireworm damage. And um, it's pretty easy to spot. You'll just see the odd dead little plant and you pop them out of the ground. And often what that wireworm does, there's, I don't know how they can do it so accurately, they'll go right through your growing point and that corn plant will die. Sometimes they'll be a little above it. And when the leaves unfurl, you'll see a little, you know, it's like when you were in school and you folded the paper to make a snowflake. Those leaves are all bundled up and each through and then all the leaves unfurl and they have multiple holes all at the same point where the wireworm just ate through all those leaves. So if you're seeing these, these leaves and this leaf's got two holes, that leaf's got two or three holes, you know, the next one about at the same point has it, it's a good chance a wireworm ate right through there. Thankfully, they missed your growing point. You know, if the corn's at this stage and it's going to get some heat and it's actively growing, you know, you're probably over the worst of it. But those cool springs where the corn is slow, like it sits and sits, for, you know, from planting to V3 and it's a month, then, you know, if you've got wireworms in there, you're going to see them for sure. So just be aware and maybe consider that when you're selecting fields that places that have a high maybe opportunity for wireworms or you know maybe think twice about how you're gonna if that's the best place to put your corn or not because uh, they can they can mow through there pretty quick. I had a field in Tabor a few years ago and that really cold cold wet summer we had the seed was in the ground a long time and the, the customer lost about 65 acres 
and you'd find a healthy corn plant or so you thought and you'd dig it out and there'd be like six wireworms in it and it just wiped the whole field out in no time so they like it and they move down the row fast right and the white worm likes to take one bite if that one bites in your growing point the damage is done right hopefully he now can't eat three or four more but uh you know it, it, it shows itself pretty interestingly out there you know so that's the the biggest one at this stage we're going to see we see some cutworm i haven't noticed it as bad as the wireworm damage but you'll definitely see some and you know they'll look like a little bit even like where that gopher damage is that you know they bit off the top and the leaves are all blunted you might see some of that that we're seeing a little bit of white grub activity and you know they feed on root hairs you know i think it's something we're going to pay a lot more attention to to see like the heavily manured lands got a lot of those grubs in there is it going to cause us a problem with our corn yet i don't know but we do seem to find a lot in fields where we're seeing wireworm damage as well so i don't know if the combination of the two is causing us troubles as well so you know that at this stage is our biggest insect pressure what's the next biggest insect for corn in our area who buys tabor corn and sometimes find worms in the pot anybody oh they're spraying lots out there then so we get a lot of european corn borer in southern alberta right and uh last year there was a lot of corn borer a lot of guys corn fell over we had a customer and we went out there and we were finding like six or eight corn borers in a stalk you know so it's just swiss cheese a little worm goes through there and they do their tunneling and the winds come and they just lay it down you know so with our silage customers We've never generally been as concerned because, you know, with the headers they're getting in and it's generally before the stalk is weakened to the point where the, you know, the winds will really push it over. We definitely seen it in some silage fields last year to a, like a yield detrimental effect, but it most scary in our grain corn fields, right? They're out there a lot longer. They're, you know, as the corn plant's drying down, that stalk strength can, you know, be so greatly reduced by all them holes in it that you'll see fields just a laid down mess. And the guy comes through with his corn header and sometimes the ears below the, you know the stripper things and they're leaving lots of ears in the field so corn borer is a significant economic pest in corn and there's a pretty simple solution and that's to buy a bag of bt corn right that's built-in corn borer protection um it's very effective it's very easy to do i don't know that there's a lot of corn left in the u.s that doesn't have a bt protection in it um the only concern there is refuge you know, so if you're going to grow a corn with the BT in it, the BT gene, you got to make sure you have a 20% refuge. If you can get the hybrid you want in a, in a refuge in the bag situation, you know, it drops that down to 5%. So right in the same bag, those two different seeds are mixed. Um, important to note, if you're the guy growing that BT corn because it also has the, the Liberty trait in it, because you want to spray Liberty on your corn to kill volunteers. If you've got refuge in the bag, you're going to kill like 5% of your corn plants. So... Uh, that's the one uh, that's still a common practice in this area. Guys like to spray a little Liberty sometimes to get their canolas and uh, they've got to be a little bit aware that they're not buying that for, for that reason and forgetting to tell somebody. So um, we're seeing a lot more hybrids in the earlier maturities coming with it. And after last year, we've had a lot of customers who have really moved more to BT corn just to, to avoid that yield loss from the corn borers. So those two are the, are the biggest you know, economic uh, uh, insect effects that we have, you know, sometimes you'll see aphids, we see a lot of that in BC, you know, they kind of get in the silks and cause a little bit of ear rot sometimes. But for the most part, those are our two big insect pests in this area. Yeah. So diseases. Corn, we're blessed in southern Alberta to not have a lot of problem with diseases. Um, we're a little bit isolated and maybe our environments are less conducive for the, the disease pressure um, historically. Last year though we did find the presence of Goss's wilt um, in four counties from here to Medicine Hat. Um, Goss's wilt has been a really ever-evolving problem in Manitoba. It's spread pretty much now all through the valley and even in some of their their new corn growing regions to the very west and uh, it's causing in you know really bad situations like 50 percent yield loss in their grain corn fields it's a bacterial disease so we can't spray any fungicide for it there's no seed treatment we can we can help to control it um, it lives in the residue so if you're a grain corn guy and you got gosses and you just keep you know building that base back up with all that residue you're putting back in the field so the one kicker is if you got a perfect year and your corn never receives a wound of any kind you're going to be okay the gosses needs an, uh, a wound to enter into the plant. And that can be as simple as two leaves rubbing against each other and cutting each other a little bit. 
sand blasting. You get a real windy day, light soils, and it blasts the sand right into the stalks. It'll bring the gosses with it. Hail, last year, that's where we've seen the worst outbreaks were in fields that have received hail. So um, I have some handouts and I'll put them on the, on the trailer later. If you're walking cornfields for a customer or yourself, take the handout, it, it has a description of it. But what it has in the back is a submission form to uh, the Horticulture Center in Brooks. And uh, Mike Harding is gonna do all the testing and what they're gonna try and develop is a better understanding of how widespread Goss's wilt is in Southern Alberta. And so you just submit your sample with the form in the back of the sheet and hopefully we can gather a better idea of how widespread this problem is. It's uh, pretty easy to spot. It's a lesion on the leaf. And if you look at this lesion, you'll see kind of like little freckles. Kind of has like a shiny, like a dried egg white appearance on it. And if you see these kind of little tan colored freckles and you hold them up to the light, the freckles go clear. So the cells have been ruptured by the disease and have kind of released their juice. And it dries this kind of color, this you know, looks a little blackish but when you hold it to the light, they go clear. So it's a pretty, pretty easy way to distinguish it quite simply. And if you're seeing that glossy shininess on there as well, it's chances it's a Goss's lesion. So like I said, you can't spray for it. And if you're seeing it or your neighbor has it or you're concerned about it, work with whomever you're buying your seed to try and find one that's, you know, has a little bit more uh, natural resistance to the disease. You know, we have some ratings. We do a, a screening in Manitoba to rate the hybrids for their natural resistance to it. And I think probably everybody's working on the same thing too. It's all through, uh, it started Nebraska, Colorado, the real dry areas in the US, but it has started to spread into the Corn Belt as well. So it's, uh, it's a pretty widespread problem in a lot of areas. Do I not get a popsicle or a bottle of water? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding, it's okay. Do you have a water? There's some. A water? Oh, there's some, okay. So for the most part, that's the biggest pressure we have from a, a disease standpoint in corn. And, and it's something we're still trying to understand how big of a deal it is in this area. Um, you know, the worst part of our situation is, like we said, often with diseases in southern Alberta, your neighbor's problem is going to be your problem pretty too soon as well. So it's something out there that moves in the wind, the spores. It can go in irrigation water. Um, it can travel a long ways pretty quick. So chances are, you know, we're going to, now we've identified it, it'll probably be something we start seeing a lot more frequently as well. If you're a silage grower and you have Goss's wilt, the benefit is you're not leaving any residue in your field, you know, maybe six or ten inches of stubble, so you're a lot better off. The ensiling process seems to kill, kill it as well, and they haven't found any traces of it once silage has been fed through an animal as well, so uh, it's a good sanitation, you know, for that as well if you're growing corn. But the residue is where, where it lives, and we had a customer and he had a half a field he silaged, and a half he combined, and he said you could see the exact line between the two, the silage. Next year, the, where the corn was, it was perfectly fine. Where the grain was, was just loaded with Goss's wilt. So, um, and yeah, and he said it was about a 40% yield loss between the two. So it can hurt you. It's a premature death of the plant. In Manitoba, it shows up a little later in the season. And so the plants die and they're not able to finish, you know, filling the ear properly. So they have light test grain or maybe it doesn't fill really at all. Here we were seeing it earlier. Um, it was kind of showing up as a drought stress within a pivot. You know, you drive by and you'd see like that dark green drought stressed corn. Maybe the leaves were curled up, but it was well under the pivot and it shouldn't be there. And that's where we targeted, you know, when we could see directly into the field to, to take our samples. You know, once the corn's big, it's pretty hard to see obviously into it. And, you know, we'll often find it just walking a pivot road or a pivot track or maybe a some guys climbed a pivot tower and seen a, a funny little short spot there, stunted corn, and that'll be where the, the gosses might be residing. Yeah. So those are our major pests, our uh, considerations for first times. Any questions? Yeah, corn back to back. I have, a, I have an old fertilizer customer. He had sweet corn on the same ground for like 30 years. It's uh, pretty common. Like anything, a rotation's always beneficial, but we just don't have a, you know, maybe if you're getting gosses wilt, then you, you know, break that cycle's good. But if you're, you know, not seeing gosses in your area yet, there's been a lot of guys back to back on corn and haven't seen, you know, real huge effects like some of the other crops on that. That said, crop rotation's always important, right? 
but a lot of guys will put their corn closest to the feedlot or you know where they want to graze the cows and they'll do it over and over and we haven't seen a real noticeable effect on that and the research out of the u.s shows the same too a lot of those guys down there they have like a canola grower in peace rivers uh, rotation right it's it's corn and snow and corn and snow and uh, they've been pretty successful that said i don't recommend not uh, having a proper crop rotation Mm -hmm. They are. I think that they, they like the plant health benefit portion of that. And, um, you know, some have seen it. Uh, we had a, sorry, I, uh, trying to be all kosher. And, um, you know, if you believe it, you believe it. And, um, some customers have seen it. I'm sure Corny's probably got guys who say the same thing and maybe they see it one out of three years. And if that's enough for them, that's good enough for them. But, uh, you know, because it's not controlling any real actual diseases, it's, you know, if it's doing something, I, I'm not really sure what that is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, maybe it helped with some of that. Yeah.